Jeffy Dahmer. Pewnie znacie tę postać. Jest to chyba najsłynniejszy morderca i kanibal. Ostatnio pojawił się też swoją drogą bardzo mocny i dobry serial. Dlatego też nagrałem ten film. Nieco wam o nim opowiem, ale pokażę wam też mega ciekawe i niepokojące nagrania. Na przykład z prywatnego, rodzinnego spotkania lub o ucieczce jednej z jego ofiar. A na końcu przedstawię wam jego ostatni wywiad. Jeffrey Dahmer przyszedł na świat w 1960 roku. Już od dziecka przejawiał niepokojące skłonności. Fascynowały go martwe zwierzęta, a ich znalezione przy drodze truchła zabierał do domu, gdzie przeprowadzał prowizoryczne sekcje zwłok lub całymi dniami obserwował proces rozkładu. W wieku nastoletnim odkrył, że jest homoseksualistą, zaś gdy miał około 15 lat zaczął fantazjować na temat przemocy na tle seksualnym. Pierwszą ofiarę Jeffrey Dahmer zamordował tuż po ukończeniu Liceum. Padło na młodego chłopaka z sąsiedztwa, którego ciało poćwiartował, a cały kolejny dzień spędził na oddzielaniu noży i tkanki od kości. Po dokonaniu zbrodni męczyły go wyrzuty sumienia, które tłumił alkoholem. Damer zapewniał, że swoje pokusy uważał za nienormalne i próbował z nimi walczyć, jednak bezskutecznie. Po kilku latach wrócił znowu do zabijania, polując głównie na czarnoskórych mężczyzn, których zwabiał do swojego mieszkania. Był samotnikiem, który marzył o uległym i biernym kochanku, zatem odurzał swoje ofiary, niekiedy wstrzykując im kwas do mózgu, by jak sam stwierdził zmienić ich w żywe zombie. Żywy trup był bowiem od niego zupełnie zależny i nigdy by go nie opuścił. Ciała swoich ofiar najczęściej rozpuszczał w kwasie i spuszczał w toalecie lub ćwiartował i wyrzucał na śmietnik. Niektóre również zjadał, ostatniemu mężczyźnie jednak udało się uciec i wezwał policję. W mieszkaniu Damera znaleziono 8 53 zdjęcia poćwiartowanych ciał. Głowę i inne części ciał trzymał w lodówce, beczce czy zamrażarce. No ale spójrzcie na nagranie jak się tłumaczył. Opowiedział o sobie, o swoich ofiarach i o wielu innych rzeczach. Zwróćcie uwagę na jego mowę ciała, ponieważ jest to też myślę mega ciekawe. So what have you been doing lately? Working and working and working and working. Working next week starting uh, Monday. I go back to work Sunday night. Oh and, boy. Uh, So you go back to work this Sunday night? Great. Yeah. It looks good though. It looks nice and trim. Oh, that's good to hear. You I look like you're working out. No. Aren't you? Oh, I haven't worked Looking out. at I've Jeff, he looks entirely normal, no. uh, clean cut, very nicely dressed, uh, responds very sociably. You still keep up your membership there though. Yeah, it's only There's nothing to indicate, that. really. Uh, that he had recently killed people. No, I've been surviving on McDonald's food yeah. for, you know, since I moved down there. Well, you're looking good. Grandma was saying Thanks. that that she thought that you got quite a bit thinner, but you look fit. I don't know. Well, I've been surviving mostly on McDonald's food. It's just so much easier just to pop into a restaurant. But, yeah, like I said before, it gets too expensive. And it does. I have to start eating at home more. And of course, you woke up at what eight this morning, right. and then you you cleaned up your apartment really nicely so you could show us what it looks like. Yeah, I want you to come over. <laughs> you feel like it. It's, it, I haven't done any dusting or vacuuming or anything. I do that on Sundays. But, uh -huh. uh, Do you know who the other person is there, that beautiful blonde sitting on the couch? You going? Aunt Terry. That's right. And who is this? Yes. That's Cousin Jeff. Yes. Oh, my word. Did you see what he did? He stole Looks like a bunch of satisfied people sitting around here. Yes. I think you can't deny the fact that, that, that he was pursuing pleasures when he was doing this. Hi, Jeff. I'm Sherry. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Hi, Jeff. Thanks, Mr. Phillips. How are you? Good to see you. I've been spending the last few days with your folks. Great. Talking about a lot of different things. Hey, you're lucky you came up on a day when there's no snow. It's snowing like crazy all weekend. Is that right? Yeah. How are things going here for you? Uh, slow and steady. 
nothing, uh, nothing out of the ordinary, really. You've read the book? Yes. Yes, I read the book. Uh, uh, my dad sent it to me uh, about last week and uh, spent all night reading it. I was up all night reading it. It was uh, quite a surprise to me, some parts of it. In what sense? In what sense? Uh, just uh, some of the things that were, were revealed uh, caught me off guard. And uh, just some, some very big surprises in it for me. Well, what was it that caught you off guard? Uh, some, of, some of his insights into uh, what he thought of me as I was growing up. All set? Everybody ready? Okay, let's take, I'll take a deep breath. Your dad comes here to visit about once a month, but I get the impression that, that the two of you don't talk a lot about everything that happened, about the crimes in particular. No, we, we don't discuss that because uh, it's been, it's been uh, gone over so thoroughly in the papers and, and the media that uh, uh, there's just really no point in, in going in depth into any in-depth talks about it. We, we talk about uh, our family, uh, home, how things used to be, uh, what uh, prison life is here, is like here now, and uh, try to keep uh, things as, as light and upbeat as possible. Is it hard for you to go back and talk about those things? Uh, no, not, not the good things. In fact, it gives me a sense of comfort to talk about uh, the, the few good times there were in the past. You say the few good times. Do you think of your childhood as having been profoundly unhappy? No, not profoundly. My childhood wasn't, wasn't uh, filled with any, any great tragedies or anything. There were good times and there were bad times. I, th I think it was fairly normal. Jeff, do you remember your, your earliest experience and earliest interest, fascination with the inside of animals? Where that came from? Uh, in ninth grade, uh, in biology class, we had uh, the usual dissection of uh, fetal pigs. I took the remains of that home and, and kept uh, the skeleton of it. And I just started branching out uh, dogs, cats, I suppose it could have turned into a, a, a normal hobby like taxidermy, but it, it didn't it veered off into into this. Why I, I don't know. All I know is that uh, I wanted to to see what the insides of these animals looked like. Was there some pleasure in in the cutting open of the animal? Yes, there was. No, no sexual pleasure, but just a. It's hard to describe sense of power, sense of control. I suppose that's a good way of putting it, yeah. yeah. I can sort of see a fascination for, you know, wanting to see uh, or, or for looking at the insides of animals, say for the first time. After you did it one time, what more is to be gained by looking at another dog's inside, the yeah. second or I the third? Know. I don't know, that's it. I came to compulsion and it switched from animals to humans. I, I, I still don't understand it. I don't know why. What would you do with the, with the dead animals, Jeff? You would pick the carcasses up from the road and take them back into the woods. Take them back in the woods, uh, skin them sometimes, uh, slit them, slit them all the way open, uh, look at the organs, feel them. There was a sort of ex uh, general excitement for me. I don't know why. It was, a, it was exciting to see. One of your dad's biggest questions is when you began to slip away, when you crossed over into this world of obsession or dark fantasy from which you just couldn't return. Can you pinpoint that? Is there a sense for when that really began to happen with you, Jeff? I think it was around age 14 or 15. Started have, having obsessive uh, thoughts of, of uh, violence uh, intermingled with sex. And it just got worse and worse. 
Uh, I didn't know how to tell anyone about it, so I didn't. I just kept it all inside. Do you have any sense for where that was coming from? No. No, I've, I've talked with uh, a few psychologists about it. They, they have their theories, but they don't have any concrete answers either. Do you have a theory? No, not really. I, I don't know where, where it came from. I probably will never know. But I, I never, I never dreamed that it would uh, become a reality. Apprehend. What was it, Jeff, that took you over the edge, do you think, and made you take this from the world of fantasy into reality? From uh, 15 on, I, I had this reoccurring fantasy of, uh, of uh, meeting a hitchhiker on the road and uh, of taking him hostage and, and doing what I wanted with him. About three years later, I was 18 years old, driving home, uh, I saw this hitchhiker about a mile from my house. I thought to myself, should I stop and pick him up or should I just keep on going? And I wish I just keep on, kept on going, but I didn't. I turned around, picked him up, and uh, that's when, that's when it, the nightmare became a reality. It just seemed so bizarre to me that this obsession that I had been thinking about and wanting, just uh, all, the, all the parts are there and they, they make it possible to make it happen. What happened after you took him to the house? The house was empty. My uh, mother was up in Chippewa Falls with her family and my dad was living in a, in a uh, rented motel about five miles away due to the divorce, and uh, I, I pretty much had the, the place to myself. I was drinking a lot during that time, and just, uh, I don't know, looking for something to, uh, some way to find some fulfillment, some, some pleasure. And I acted on my fantasies, and uh, that's where everything went wrong. This was the summer of 1978 when you took your first victim. Right. Once it happened the first time, it just seemed like uh, it had control of my life from there on in. The second occurrence was 1984, roughly. And I met this guy at one of the uh, bars, downtown Milwaukee bars. We went back to the hotel. Just planning on... Uh, Getting drunk, I had put some sleeping pills in his drink to render him unconscious. And I uh, was just going to spend the night with him. When I woke up in the morning, uh, my forearms were bruised, and his chest was, was bruised, and blood was coming out of his mouth. He was hanging over the side of the bed, and uh, I have no memory of beating him to death, but I must have. And that's when it when it all started again. And once it started again, you found it impossible to stop. Right, that, that's when the, the obsession went into full swing. Did you ever tell yourself, I have to stop this, I must stop doing this? Yes. When it was going on? After, after the second time, it seemed like the compulsion to do it was too strong, and I, I didn't even try to stop it after that. But uh, after, before the second time, things had been building up gradually, uh, going to bookstores, going to uh, the bars, the gay bars, uh, bath clubs. When that, did, when that wasn't enough, uh, buying sleeping pills and, and using it on uh, various guys in the bath clubs, it just escalated slowly but surely. And uh, after the second time, which was uh, not planned, uh, it was out of control. It felt like it was out of control. Where did sex enter in? To the killings, Jeff? It was a big part of it. My, my only objective was to find the, the best looking uh, guy that I could. Their sexual preference didn't matter to me. Did their race matter to you? No, their race didn't matter to me. The first, the first two 
young men were white, the, set, the third young man was American Indian, the fourth and fifth were Hispanic. So, no, race had nothing to do with it. It was just their looks. Was there something sexual in the dismemberment of the bodies for you? As time went on, uh, yes, I, I did get a, there was a sexual part, part to that. Uh, I started saving the, the skeletons and preserving other parts. And uh, one thing led to another. It took, it took more and more uh, deviant type behaviors to satisfy uh, my urges. And so I just uh, spiraled out of control. Why the cannibalism? It, it, it made me feel like they were uh, a permanent part of me. Besides, besides the just mere curiosity of what it would be like, it made them feel that they were a part of me, and it, it gave me a, a sexual uh, uh, satisfaction to do that. Was it the killing that excited you? Or is it what happened after the killing? No, the, the killing was just a means to an end. That, that was the least set, uh, satisfactory part. I didn't enjoy doing that. That's why I tried to uh, create uh, living zombies with uh, muriatic acid in the, in the drill. Uh, but it, it never worked. No, the killing wasn't, wasn't the objective. I just wanted to have the person under my complete control not having to to consider their wishes, being able to keep them there as long as I wanted. Uh, it's not easy to say that, but that's that's what the motive was. Where did that need for control come from? Do you have any idea? I don't know. Maybe I felt uh, I had no control as a as a child or young adult, and uh, that got mixed in with my sexuality and. I ended up doing what I did was my way of feeling in, in complete control, at least for that situation, creating my own little world where I had the final say, uh, finding the best looking guy that I could and uh, having total mastery over him for as long as I wanted. Lust played a big part of it, controlling lust. That, uh, that was the motive right there. A lot of this came out in the course of the trial. Obviously, both of you sat through this. Have the two of you sat down and talked about these things before? <clears throat> no. Not in depth. This is the first time you're talking about these things. With your, I've talked with your dad here. At great length with, with uh, psychiatrists, court-appointed psychiatrists, psychologists, but uh, not with my family. I we learned. We learned everything at the trial and in the confessions and that sort of thing after the fact. The two of you never really communicated all that much, did you, father and son? Not on any, not on any deep, deep level, no. We talked about superficial things. Uh, never really had a, a real deep heart-to-heart -heart talk about what was going on inside our own minds. I was, I was always a very private person. I didn't like to uh, open up and, and share anything with anyone. Uh, I liked to keep my thoughts to myself. Why do you think that was? Uh, because from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable with anyone. So I just uh, closed myself off and put on uh, a mask of normalcy. You've read the book. Right. He called it a father's story. Pretty simple title. Right. Not a simple story, though. No, not a simple story. Not one that was easy for me to read. But uh, I'm glad he wrote it. Did it hurt? Was it painful to read? Yes, it was painful. Some parts of it were, uh, for me, were even fun to read. There were, there were good parts. So it wasn't all negative. Was it emotional for you, reading the book? Yes, it was. Tell me. 
What kind of feelings did you have reading it? Uh, deep regret. Um, sorrow. I guess those were the two main emotions. Is there anything in this book that you strongly disagree with? Uh, yes, I, I disagree with uh, the description of me as, as being so uh, incredibly shy and introverted because maybe that's that's the way my dad saw me because uh, there was there was so much tension in the home that I really didn't uh, feel like being up and uh, happy a lot of the times. Uh, but with my friends in school, uh, I had I had uh, a good time. We had good, you know, good uh, social life, and so I wasn't uh, so so extremely reclusive and uh, self-centered as it, as it portrays me. Does it surprise you to hear Jeff say that he doesn't think of himself and never did as innately shy? It did surprise me. Uh, maybe my perception was uh, accentuated to the extreme. But you do recall at age six that you became more aware of tensions in the home. Oh yeah, that's that's the time I really, really remember uh, noticing that things weren't quite right. So it wasn't so much in a shyness as it was wanting to withdraw from tension and arguments and problems in the house. That's how I saw it, yeah. I uh, sort of uh, lived in my own little fantasy world when things got too heated in the household. And uh, I carried that over for, for years, I guess. And was there violence in that fantasy world? No, no, not, early on. Not, not that. Uh, not the type that to show itself later. No, it was just uh, just my own little world where I had control. Was was anger a part of it for you, Jeff? I had some anger. Probably every kid has some anger, you know, about their childhood. Uh, it really wasn't wasn't a terrible childhood, though. You know, there were, there were a lot of good times. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a really terrible time. So Pat theories about you as a serial killer striking out to get back at your dad. For oh, instance, no, 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 no. That has no truth in it. The only motive that there ever was was to completely control a person, a person that I found physically attractive, and uh, keep them with me as long as possible, even if it meant just keeping apart. Did you know before you read this book that your dad had his own obsessions and fantasies that he had thought about, that he had dreamed of committing murder, that he had uh, had an obsession with fire and with explosives? No, that's, uh, that, I don't think that's the type of thing one asks one's dad. Were you surprised to read that about your dad? Uh, very surprised. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know what to think about it. Uh, I suppose everyone has their, their secret thoughts, and so it was somewhat of a shock. You feel grateful that your father wrote this book? Or do you feel put off by it? I mean, I'm just curious about your, your overall reaction to it. Do you feel, a, is the book an invasion, do you think? or is No, it... no, I, I feel uh, nothing but pride for him for writing the book and uh, having the courage to uh, bear his soul when he didn't have to. He, did, he didn't have to get involved with uh, trying to, you know, help me out and support me and be a, an emotional support for me. And uh, I'll be grateful to him forever for it. Did you ever consider talking to your parents, to your dad, about homosexuality? Is that something no, that you felt you could ever raise? Early on... I, I really didn't know that much about it myself. Uh, all I knew was that it was something that uh, was to be kept hush-hush, not uh, talked about, not even thought about. So I just uh, kept it all within me and never never talked about sexual issues at all, really, with anybody. Do you think if you had been able to talk about that in a more open way, with your dad, for instance, that it would have helped, might have broken this 
veil of secrecy and enabled you to keep yourself from going down that road? Uh, I don't know exactly what, if anything, would have kept, ever kept me from going down that road. Talking about it, I don't think would have made that much difference. Because, like I said, there were things going on in my head that uh, I would have never opened up and talked about with anybody. Your dad says he never realized how deeply troubled you were because he just thought you were shy the way he had been shy as a boy. Do you think the signs were there and he just missed them? No, I don't think so. Because uh, I had thoughts, I had fantasies, but there was, there was no outward show of, of anything that was wrong. You were pretty good at keeping it all inside. All right, I kept it inside didn't share any of my uh, thoughts or emotions with anybody. So uh, how would I ever know? No, you, you never saw any of it, as far as I know. I did not really hear from anyone about any of these activities. And that, that's what really strikes me now, is if I would, if I would have known, what would I have done about it? I think I, I would have done a lot about it. I feel it's... Uh, wrong for people who commit crimes to try to shift the blame onto somebody else, onto their parents or onto their, their upbringing or, circ or living circumstances. I, I think that's just a, a cop-out. And uh, my parents, my relatives, had no knowledge of what I was doing. They're absolutely not responsible for any of it in any way. And uh, I take full responsibility. But you, understand, but you understand that what you did would lead your father to ask himself all kinds of questions. That's true. Where, where I did I go that. wrong? Was there something I could have said or done to have prevented this? Right. Did I in some way create or contribute to the terrible acts my son committed? I understand that. I, I just get uh, angry with other people who, who think that uh, they have a right to... Uh, to somehow try to blame my parents for what happened. That's not right at all. No one has the right to do that because they're totally innocent. They had no knowledge of it. And uh, that angers me. But parents just naturally, I mean, any parent that really cares, they just, first of all, say, I, gee, I feel guilty. You know, I, there's just feelings of guilt. What happened? What did I do? What could I have done? So that's a normal parental reaction. Your dad has wondered about all kinds of things, from the medication that your mom was on during her pregnancy, to the fact that you were exposed to violent arguments in the home from an early age and continuing, to the possibility that he might have passed on some genetic propensity for obsession or violent behavior. Does any of that ring true to you? I can see why he'd wonder about those things, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, they're all excuses because I didn't feel accountable to anybody. I didn't feel that I had to, to uh, face what I had done ever. And uh, so you, you have, there comes a point where a person has to, has to be accountable for what he's done. Can't go, can't go around making excuses, uh, blaming other people or other things. So I, I alone am the one who's responsible for what's happened. Let me ask, when did you first feel that everyone is accountable for their actions. Well, thanks to you for, for sending uh, that uh, creation science uh, material. Because I always, I always believe the, uh, the lie that uh, evolution is truth, the theory of evolution is truth, that we all just came from uh, the slime and uh, when, we, when we died, you know, that was it. There was nothing. So uh, the whole theory cheapens life and uh, started reading books about how, that show how evolution is, is just a complete lie. There's, there's, no, there's no basis in science to, uh, to uphold it. And I've come to, since come to believe that, uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the true creator of uh, the heavens and the earth. It just didn't just happen. And uh, I've accepted him as my Lord and Savior. And I believe that I, as well, as well as everyone else, will be accountable to him. Growing up, did you feel that you were accountable to your dad or to your mom? 
as the authority. Yes, I did. You're in the house. Yes, I did. I mean, they they didn't let me uh, run wild. They were they disciplined me, and uh, so I felt accountable to them. But afterwards, after I left the home, that's that's when I. Uh, started wanting to uh, sort of create my own little world where I could be the one who had the complete control, where I didn't have to uh, bow to anyone else's demands, and uh, I just took it way too far. Well, at that period of time, I had drifted away from a belief in a supreme being, and I never, as a result, passed along the feeling that we are all accountable in the end. He owns us. And that basic concept is very fundamental to all of us. You feel that the absence, at least for a while, of a strong religious faith and yes. belief for some years may have prevented you from instilling some of that in Jeff. That's right. Is that how you feel? Yes, I think I had a big, uh, big part to do, to do with it. I mean, uh, if you don't, if a person doesn't think that there there is a God to be accountable to, then then what's what's the point of, of trying to uh, modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges? That's how I thought anyway, and uh, I've since come to believe that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is truly God, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're the only true God. What do you remember about your parents arguing when you were growing up, and what effect that had on you? It was it was unnerving, depressing, uh, made me angry sometimes. Uh, I'd leave the house, go out in the woods, and uh, sulk, brooding, you know, wondering why they had to uh, have such a rough relationship. Uh, most of the time, they didn't seem to get along too well together. I never knew what the real, real underlying problems were. I didn't. I didn't feel it was my place to ask. Did you blame one or the other? Mom no. or dad? No. No, I didn't. I was just frustrated that things couldn't be uh, happier around the house. You just wanted things to be more peaceful. Right. Right. I never saw any any real violent arguments as far as physical. Uh, hitting or anything like that, but there was a lot of yelling, a lot of uh, tension in the house sometimes. One of the one of the chilling stories that your dad tells is about the box he had found. Can you give me your your perspective on that? Uh, I had a box in my uh, bedroom closet, and uh, it it. Uh, contained uh, the mummified head and, and uh, genitals of uh, a young man I met in one of the bars down in Milwaukee. And it was a locked metal box. Uh, my dad, uh, one week, came to visit and happened to see it, and uh, we got into uh, a bit of an argument because I wouldn't open it up. He... Uh, took the, the locked box down to the basement and was about to uh, smash it open. What, what were you thinking as he was making his way downstairs to open the box? Well, I was outside, and I was thinking I've got to stop this from happening. Uh, uh, I didn't know what I'd do or say. I didn't know what would happen. I thought, you know, it's all going to come crashing down now. And uh, But the box was never opened. Uh, not my dad's presence, and so the uh, the lies continued. The whole scenario just continued for years after that. Were there times when your dad may have been closer to discovering what was going on than even he knew? Times where you got worried that maybe he would find something out. The box incident was about uh, as close as it came. Yeah. That was just one incident. There were there were others, but that was a, a particularly nerve-wracking one. Are there others you can you, you can share? Uh, Are there close calls? 
when uh, when acidified dissolved human remains were found they weren't they didn't look like human remains anymore but they were in the, the trash bin outside in the garage um, that was one incident and I, a few others I'd rather not go into right now were you relieved to be arrested part of me part of me was and part of me wasn't explain uh, part, I don't know it's it's like uh, I don't believe I have a split personality but you you know the feeling where oh you're you're sort of glad about something but on the other hand you're not that's that's how it was I was it was a relief not to have to uh, keep such a gigantic secret that I had kept for so many years and once I saw that I had no choice but to face it I uh, decided to face it head on and uh, make a full confession. So uh, I am glad that the secrets are, are gone. Your father told me that one of the reasons he wrote this book was in order to put down on paper what he has been unable to say to you in words, kind of reaching out to you. What do you want to say to him? having read this. I tell you, Dad, I'm really sorry that this has happened, and I love you a lot. I love you, too. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. We, uh, we haven't always shown it a lot, but uh, I, I do love him a great deal. I love you. And uh, without, the, without the support of my folks, uh, I don't think I would have uh, come through this. We, we've opened up with each other a lot more now since since the trial and everything. There's no secrets to be to be uh, hidden away. You know, I don't feel that I have to keep any secrets from him. Uh, we've come to face what's real now instead of just glossing things over and talking about superficial things. So there's there's a lot there's a lot more communication between us. This book may serve as, as a further bridge between Jeff and, and myself. And uh, just for that purpose, I regard it as valuable for me. Do you feel closer to your dad having read this? I feel that I feel closer in that uh, I understand more how he was thinking, what his thoughts were, um, what, what some of his motivations were. I'm glad he wrote it. Anything not in the book you want to say to him? I, I can't think too clearly right now. I'm feeling pretty emotional. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, a lot of things have been brought out in this interview that... Uh, has brought us to a little bit deeper, just a little bit closer understanding as to uh, how this all originated. And, uh, well, whenever I get emotional, my analytical side is gets clouded, and I can't express myself quite as, much, as well as I would like. Can you talk about the feelings you have? You feeling close I to Jeff? I feel very close to Jeff, and it's going to continue until our death. And I feel good about it. Do you think you'll ever have the answers you've been looking for about why, what happened, and what role, if any, you played? Maybe not. With my primary uh, question is the origins of it. And if something can be learned about that, it may help other people avert problems. Is it still there, Jeff? Does it ever go away? In part, no, it never, it never completely goes away. I'll uh, probably have to live with it for the rest of my life. I wish it would go away. I wish I, there was some way to completely get rid of, of the, the compulsive thoughts, the feelings. Uh, it's not nearly so bad now that there, there's no avenues to, to actually act on it. But, uh, no, it never seems to go completely away. So the thoughts still come to you? Sometimes. 
Yeah. Are you different, Jeff, in terms of what, how you think back on all of this? I would hope I'm different. Uh, I'm glad that I, I'm glad that I'm in a position now where I don't feel a compulsion to do these things. I'm glad that it's over. Any words I say to the to the victims' families are are just going to seem trite and empty. Uh, I I don't know how to express the regret, the sorrow. Uh, that I feel for what I've done for their for their sons. Uh, I can't find the right words. All right, see you later, Dan. Okay. After the interview at the prison, Dahmer casually showed us something a little unsettling. This is a point of interest. That that's the type of box. This what? This is the type of box. Exactly. He wanted us to know that box looked strikingly like the one his father had found, the one Jeffrey had used to hide body parts. Thank you, Jeff.